I'm not a scholar. I'm not an educated man. I'm not even a religious man. But I've always loved these ancient words from a song. The Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I love that psalm for two reasons. First of all, because it describes God, Adonai, the the Almighty One, as a shepherd. And that's a God I can understand. I also love it because it was written by our greatest king, King David. And King David was once a shepherd just like me. My name is Benjamin, and I'm a shepherd. In our language, we called it a roe. You should know I didn't become a shepherd by my own choice. My father was a farmer, and he happened to own his own land, lots of land. And so I grew up as a child learning how to grow crops and how to breed animals. But as the youngest of four sons, I didn't have a part in the inheritance. All the land went to my older brothers. That was the law of the birthright in our culture. So when I was old enough, I had to find something else to do with my life and energy. So I went out looking for work. And I found work, finally, on a sheep farm. I think you would call it a ranch. And I started out as a hireling which is kind of a shepherd in training, and I was paid to do just the the dirtiest of chores. I was the one that had to clean out the sheepfold. I was the one who collected all the wool at shearing time. I had to fix the, the feeding mangers when they were broken. But eventually, over time, my boss came to trust me as a good worker, and eventually he trusted me also with the sheep, and I became a shepherd. Now, this may sound strange to you, but I didn't resent my brothers. I wasn't bitter about not having a part in the inheritance because that's just the way it was among our people. I just understood it as being God's will. It was God's plan for me. But the thing I had a hard time understanding was why so many people looked down on us as shepherds. They seemed to have forgotten that before he was a king, as I mentioned before, King David himself was a shepherd boy. And it was King David who wrote the words, The Lord is my shepherd, Adonai Rohi. So I wondered why they looked down on us. When we went to town, which wasn't very often, people would avoid us. They weren't hostile. They didn't say things. But you could tell they avoided us. It might have been because of our appearance. We lived in the field most of the time. It might have been because of the smell of our garments. But most of all, I think it was because of our religious law. The rabbis of the time taught people, taught us, that there were things that were unclean that one should not come into contact with, like, for example, dead animals or blood. To come into contact with those things made one unclean before God, at least according to our religious law. And as shepherds, we were constantly around animals, so we came into contact with dead animals or blood almost on a daily basis And that made us unclean before a holy God. It meant that we could not go to the temple in Jerusalem and pray like everyone else. We couldn't participate in the great sacrificial feasts that everyone else did. In order to become clean, we would have to go through what was called a cleansing ritual. We'd have to have our hands washed a certain way. Our feet, our entire bodies, every piece of clothing we wore had to be washed a specific way, and it could take up to seven days to become clean again. And as shepherds, we just couldn't do that. We couldn't take that much time away from the flocks, at least not over and over again. So most of us just accepted that this was our lot in this life, and we just hoped that somehow, some way, God would be merciful upon us. And I hoped That if God was indeed like a shepherd, as David said, maybe he would understand. Maybe he would understand that being a roe was hard, was hard work. We took care of the flock 24-7, 365. Sheep need almost constant supervision and care. When the flock stayed out in the fields at night, which they usually did, we were expected to sleep with them out in the field. And when we brought them into the fold, 
We were expected to sleep there too, usually across the opening, the entranceway into the fold, so we could protect them from predators like coyotes or jackals, even wolves sometimes. That's why most of us carried a stick. I carried a smaller one with a knob at the end. Some carried a longer one with a crook on the end. Many shepherds carried slings, and they used them as weapons. They could protect the flock, and they could also protect themselves. We had no homes of our own. Our home was with the sheep. When they migrated to find food or water or grazing land, we migrated with them. It made it very difficult to have a family, and that's one of the reasons why I never married. Well, that's enough about me for now, but let me ask you, how much do you know about sheep? My guess is some of you think of sheep as white, fluffy creatures that are all cute and cuddly. Well, I'm here to tell you that they're only cute and cuddly from a distance. If you see them up close, sheep are actually pretty dirty creatures. Their wool secretes a kind of oil that causes almost everything to stick to it. Mud, grass, briars, twigs, even their own dung. One of our jobs as shepherds was to periodically clean the sheep by hand. And it was just about as bad as it sounds. You should also know that sheep aren't the smartest of barnyard creatures. They're, first of all, easily frightened. Uh, They get confused easily. They have a terrible sense of direction, and that's a bad combination. They wander off, and they get lost with great regularity. And it always made me think of the words of the prophet that I heard once. All we like sheep have gone astray, the prophet wrote. It made me smile to think that God himself saw us like sheep in many ways. And when you think about it, it's really kind of true. We get confused, we get frightened easily, we lose our way, we get lost, and we need help, and lots of stuff sticks to us. Isn't that true? And when one of the sheep would get lost, and it happened on a daily, if not uh, hourly basis, our job as shepherds was to go find them. No matter what it took, we had to find them, because we knew that when they were lost and alone, they were most vulnerable. Sometimes they would get tangled up in briars or their wool would get caught in trees or they they would get their hooves stuck between two stones. And sometimes they would just fall over. And if they were too heavy, either due to how fat they were or how much wool they had, they couldn't even right themselves again. And they would be extraordinarily vulnerable to hungry predators. And each sheep was worth months of wages for us as shepherds. And so they they were too valuable for us to lose. Another reason we'd go out looking for them is that we, we eventually came to care for them. Even though they were dirty and helpless as a shepherd, you couldn't help it. You would get to know your sheep. From the time that the ewes gave birth and you held those baby lambs in your arms, almost like human babies, to the time when they're full grown and heavier than a man, you would get to know them. Some were more fearful than others. Some were more stubborn than others. Some are more trusting, and so forth. And it's funny because even though they weren't terribly bright, uh, they would get to know you as their shepherd. Each of us had a distinctive call we would give. And you could be out in a field, and if one shepherd gave his call, you could see the sheep that recognized his voice would look up because they knew. They knew the voice of their own shepherd. And that's why I've always loved what King David wrote about God. If God indeed was like a shepherd, a roe, one who cares for, guides, and loves his sheep. And that's the way I saw my role, and that's the way I tried to do my job every day. Now, the sheep in our flock were were special. They weren't just any sheep. And I don't mean to brag, but the man who owned our sheep had a contract with the priests at the great temple in Jerusalem. So, It was our flock that provided sacrificial animals at the time of the Passover. Do you know about Passover? Do you know what that is to us? Well, Passover refers to the time when the people of Israel were in bondage in Egypt. And Moses, the great man of God, led them out of Egypt. And on the night that they escaped, they put the blood of slaughtered lambs over the door frames of their homes. So that when the angel of death passed over, he would pass over them and bring judgment to the Egyptians. And it was the great story of our people called the Exodus. It was a time for our people to celebrate that great story. 
So on, at the Passover feast, thousands of lambs were brought to Jerusalem and they were sacrificed in memory and their blood sprinkled as an atonement for the sins of the people. And many of our sheep, many of my sheep, were destined for that great purpose. So the sheep from our flock were special and they had to be perfect in every way. If there was a blemish on a sheep, when the priest examined it, it would be rejected. And we wouldn't get any payment for that sheep. So when the ewes gave birth, we would immediately take the little lambs, especially the ones that looked like they had the potential to be sacrificial lambs, and we would wrap them up tightly. And sometimes we would put them, lift them off the ground and put them into the feeding trough that we called a manger so that they wouldn't get trampled by the other animals. We were supposed to keep the sheep, uh, the finest of the sheep, separate from all the others so that they would be acceptable to the priest, and we assumed to God himself they would bring the highest prices. And sometimes in that whole process, I would wonder how it was that the blood of one of these helpless animals could bring atonement for human beings, for human sin, for, for even for my sin. And I sometimes wondered if my sheep knew of the sacrifice that they were destined to make. But you aren't here tonight to hear me just talk about sheep. You want to hear about that night. You want to hear about the night that changed everything. Well, here's what happened. We had a large flock, several hundred sheep, so there were four of us shepherds working together all the time, and we had two hirelings helping us out. We slept in shifts, so there were always two of us awake to keep watch over the flock. It was nearing the time of year we would move them all inside to the pen due to the cold, and Passover was just a few months away, so we were uh, taking extra precautions at this time. Uh, it was late at night. It was the second shift of the night, and I had just finished walking the perimeter because my shift was almost over. And I sat down next to a tree, just a stone's throw or so from a little campfire where the others were sleeping, waiting for their turn. And that's when I first saw it, a kind of small shimmering light just on the eastern horizon. At first I thought maybe I'd nodded off and I was waking up and it was morning and the sun was just starting to come up in the east. But then I looked around and no, it was still pitch dark, middle of the night, uh, except for this, this light, this shimmering light that grew closer and closer and larger and larger. At first it seemed kind of like a campfire, and then it seemed like maybe a few or a dozen campfires, and then it felt like all the air around me had burst into flame itself. And then I realized that at the center of the light there was, there was a figure, like a man only much larger, and so brilliant I had to shade my eyes. And then the light was all around me, and it became, and I have never been able to describe it, it became like a weight. The light was like a weight, and the weight pushed me down until I was on my knees in the cold mud. And then the weight of that light was so great, the power of whatever that was was so near that I, my, my heart began to pound, and I could feel the adrenaline surging in me, and I feared that I might die right on the spot. And no longer was I on my knees, but I was on my face in the mud, crushed by the sheer weight of the glory around me. And then out of that glory came a voice, a voice like thunder in a storm. And the voice said, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good news of great joy, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And for some reason I can remember, at that moment I became aware that I could taste the mud that was on my face. And the voice continued. It said, and this will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And when the voice stopped speaking... I heard another sound. It started very small, like a murmur far away. And then it was closer, the sound, of, the sound like of wings beating the air. Many, many wings. And then voices. Voices, some voices high and wild like trumpets. Other voices so deep that I feared my ears could not bear the sound. A thousand voices, a thousand times ten thousand voices. And they came as a great flood. A sound so loud it almost threatened to break my ears. A sound so sweet I never wanted it to end. A music I never forgot. And the voices sang all together, glory 
to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. Over and over again, the chorus rang out and rang out until it seemed the whole world was full of that chorus. I don't know how long the singing continued. Maybe five minutes, maybe five seconds, maybe five hours. I have no idea. And then just like that, it was gone. Quiet. Just stillness. And the light was gone too, and there I was. I was lying still in the, in the mud with my face down, murmuring to myself, glory, glory, glory. So I staggered to my feet, and I looked around, and the others were just doing the same thing I was doing. They had the same look on their faces. Their mouths were hanging open. Their eyes were wide as if in shock or, shock or joy, and I can only assume I looked the same to them. And we ran toward each other like a group of drunken men, and we hugged in a tangle, a mad tangle of, of arms and, and dirty cloaks and sticks and rods, and we were talking and shouting all at the same time. Whoa, man, did you see that? Did you hear that? What was that? Who was that? Did you hear it too? What did he say? And then one of us said, what did the brightest one say? Wait. And I remembered. He said, unto you this day, in the city of David, a Savior is born who is Christ the Lord. A Savior, the Christ the one we called Mashiach, it meant anointed one in our language. We had heard those phrases since we were children. The one promised by the prophets. And then one of my friends said, the city of David, that's Bethlehem. That's just over the next hill. I think we should go. And I said, I think we're supposed to go. So we quickly grabbed the two hirelings, told them to stay behind and watch the flock. And we'd be back as fast as we could and we ran. We ran as fast as our legs and the mud would let us. We actually had to stop twice along the way. We just weren't used to running like that. We stopped the third time because the tallest one, Aaron, tumbled headlong over a tree branch, and we had to help him up. And we got to town finally, and everything was quiet. So we went to the first home that had a light on in the window. We banged on the door. A woman with a round face comes to the door, and one of us blurts out, Is he here? Is he here? And she just looked irritated. She said, Is who here? And I said, Who? Him, you know, him, the one we were told about. Her face just was completely blank. I said, you didn't see the light? You didn't hear the music? And now she got even more irritated. She said, go home, go home, sleep it off, leave me alone before I call security. And she slammed the door in our faces. Then we saw there was another smaller inn just down the street. We went down there. We banged on that door. Never crossed our minds it was the middle of the night. We banged on that door until someone opened the door. It was an older woman, longer gray hair, she says, all full, all full. There's a census going on. You're late. You're too late. All full. And I said, we don't want a room. We don't want a room. We're looking for a baby. Has a baby been born here tonight? She said, what are you talking about? What time is it anyway? And I was going to tell her about the light and the choir. And then I, I just said, sorry to bother you. And again, the door was slammed in our faces. And I was starting to think that maybe, maybe we had misunderstood what had happened to us. And just then we saw a young boy walking down the street in the dark, and he was carrying what looked like a load of charcoal in a basket. And that was odd because it was the middle of the night. It wasn't time for chores. So one of my friends said, Hey, son, have you heard anything about a child being born tonight? And the boy looked up a bit frightened and a bit surprised, and he said, uh, I'm going there now. They need more charcoal. And so we followed him to the end of that street, and there was a small home. In the front of the small home, there was a woman standing as if waiting for the boy, and she looked frazzled and tired and impatient. She said, where have you been? It's freezing back there. And then she noticed the four of us, and she immediately said, like everyone else, sorry, fellows, all full up, no room. And we said, we don't need a room. We're not looking for a room. We're looking for a baby. And then she just shook her head. She said, well, they don't have any room for you back there either. I feel terrible putting them back there. They had to have the baby and put them in a manger. And how sad is that? But that she was going to have that baby. She was in labor. I needed to find something. It's the best I can do, I'm telling you. And then she looked at the boy who was still standing there, and she was mad. She said, what are you still standing there for? Get back there and make them a fire. So we followed him. We followed him back around the corner to the side of the house where they kept animals in a small pen. And we went around the corner. That's when we heard it for the first time. The squeak of a cry. 
It was pretty dark, just the glow of a small charcoal fire, but I could see a young woman lying under a blanket. And next to her was a man kneeling, and he was stroking her hair with his hand. When he looked up and saw us, he didn't seem surprised, and he didn't seem frightened, but he just went, put his fingers to his lips, and he, as if to say, shh. And we looked, and we could see the woman was sleeping. And just next to the woman, there was a feeding trough, what we called a manger used by oxen and mules for feeding times. And in the manger was a newborn wrapped up snug in swaddling cloths. And I couldn't believe my eyes. My heart leapt into my throat because it was just as we had been told. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. None of us said a word, at least not that I can remember, but we did quietly drop our rods and our shepherd's bags and we knelt on the ground right in front of the manger. It just seemed like the right thing to do and we were there for a while and I just stared at I stared at the at the little bundle of flesh. Little fists pulled up close to his face, hair matted in rings on his forehead and my mind was swimming with all that we had seen and heard. I had a million questions. The light from heaven, had I been dreaming that? Had that really happened? The words of the bright stranger, good news of great joy, a Savior. I thought to myself, really? This is him, the anointed one, lying like an animal in a feeding trough? So small, so fragile, I couldn't help but thinking so much like a helpless little lamb. How could it be? How could this be the Savior? How could this be the Messiah, our King? And then it hit me, or I should say two words hit me. To you, the visitor had said. A Savior has been born to you. And then he told us exactly where to find him. Can I tell you what those two little words meant? To you meant to me, the youngest son, the one left out of the birthright. It meant to me, a shepherd, one who was unclean before God and unwanted by men. It meant to me, one who tends animals, animals that will be offered as sacrifices for the sins of the people, but sacrifices I will never be allowed to make for myself. To you meant he had come to me. To you meant that no longer would I be beyond the reach of his rod and his staff, his care and his forgiveness. To you meant that as I had gone after my sheep when they were lost and alone, so he had come after me when I was lost. To you meant that God, the one David called Adonai Roi, knew me and remembered me. I was not forgotten. It meant that I, Benjamin the shepherd, mattered to him. I don't know how long we stayed there, but I felt tears running down my face. And what I remember about that was I wasn't sad. I don't think I'd ever cried before when I wasn't sad. I wasn't sad. No, I was happy. But happy is not the right word. I was was full. I felt loved. I had hope. And in some way, I knew I was home. Not sure how long we stayed, but the baby started to stir and would soon need his mother. So all at once, we just bowed our heads, our foreheads to the ground in front of the major, in front of the child. And when we stood up, we nodded our respects to the man and his wife, who was now awake, and she was watching us with curiosity in her face as we honored her child. And then we left. We walked back to our flocks. At first we talked excitedly about what we had seen and heard, trying to make sense of what it all might mean for us, for our people, maybe for the whole world. But the last mile or so, we just walked in silence. And as we were walking along, I could hear the sound of our our feet as we scuffled through the mud and the dry grass. I looked up at the dark night sky, first hint of light coming over the eastern horizon, and I breathed a prayer to God. And I thanked him. 
I thanked him for everything I could think of, for the cool night air, for the light that had terrified me and drove me into the mud, for the taste of the mud itself as I fell on my face, for the music, the singing that I would never forget, and for the child, wrapped up tight, laying in a feeding trough. I thanked him for the good news, the good news of a Savior, a Savior that would be for all people, and I knew in that moment that my life would never be the same. I would never be just a roe anymore. I would be a messenger with the breath that I had left. I would never stop telling the story. I would never stop telling of the child in the manger. I would never stop sharing the good news that a Savior has come. A Savior that has come for me and for you.